Okay, so uh, in the discussion of extrema, first I'm going to cover global extrema, then I'm going to cover local extrema. Okay, so let's just start with global extrema. So the idea is that you have a function from some set to some set, you have a range of that function, and then you say, is there a biggest number in that range? If there is, you would call that the global maximum. And if there's a least number in that range, you would call that the global minimum, okay? So uh, if, if this is the graph of a function um, over its entire domain, then we would be interested in uh, this point down here at x equals two, that seems to be a global uh, minimum value of zero. And up here, there's a global maximum value of 50 something. Um, it seems to be at x is equal to four. Okay, so when we're talking about global maxima and minima, we're talking about things like this. Okay, so let's start with a simple function. Yeah, is there a question? Well, can you go back to previous slide? Yeah. This can it mean your minimum, uh, minimum minus two minimum? Yeah. So well, there there is a global maximum of of zero at x is equal to two, and there's a global maximum at four of x is equal to. Um, well, at x equals four of 50 something. And over here, if you want, it's, it's a minimum in its own local neighborhood. So you might say that that's a local maximum, but I'm talking about global minimum and global maximum at this point. So, so the greatest value in the range of the function and the least value in the range of the function. Okay, sir, so, so minimum would be zero and maximum would be 57 like Yes, yeah, something like that. Okay. Okay. All right, so let's consider um, that one had a range which was over a, a finite interval. What about over all of the reals? We have f sends reals to reals defined by f of x equals x squared. Okay, in the range of that function, what's the least value that you can have? That's zero, right? f of zero is equal to zero squared is zero. And you can't get any negative numbers out of the squaring function. So that, so you have a global minimum of zero at x equals zero. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Now I claim that there's no global maximum. Okay. Because as you go away from zero, either to the left or to the right, the values just keep getting bigger and bigger. Right. So there's no maximum value that the, there's no maximum value in the range, right? The range Wait, is, is that because we don't have a, a defined range. Right, right. We we see we have an unlimited range, in the sense that the range goes from zero, including zero, to infinity. Right. So there's no biggest number in the range of this function. So we say Which is a no global yeah. maximum. Okay, sir. Okay. Now, let's consider this one. F sends the interval zero to one, uh, square bracket means including zero, round bracket means not including one, to the reals defined by F of X equals X squared. Okay. Now, it, the value zero is in the range because f of zero is zero. And you can't get negative numbers out of a squaring function. So that's the global minimum. There's a global minimum of zero at x is equal to zero. Okay. And there is no global maximum. Okay. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Right, so Okay, so think about it like this. F of 0 0.9 is 0 0.9 squared, right? 
an f of 0 0.99 is 0 0.99 squared, which is bigger than 0 0.9 squared. And then you can have 0 0.999 squared, which is bigger than 0 0.99 squared, right? So you can get yeah, numbers yeah. which are bigger and bigger. Uh, you, you can't get the value one because one is not in the domain of this function. Uh, so you are saying that if you multiply 0 0.9 multiply by 0 0.9, you will get 0 0.81, but it always be less than one. Yeah, every number that you have in the range of this function is always less than one, but one uh, is never in the range of this function. So you, you uh, sir, yeah. Sir, if one was included in the domain, so we would have a global maximum, right? Yeah, sure. Okay, so there's no global maximum in this function either. Okay, now if we have f sends minus one to one, including minus one to one to the reals, defined by f of x equals x squared, right? Again, you can get the value zero because zero is in the domain of the function and zero squared is zero, and you can't get negative values out of the squaring function. So there's a global minimum of zero at x equals zero. What's the biggest values in the, the biggest value in the range of this function is one. And that value occurs at X equals plus one and X equals minus one. So the, glo uh, the, the locations of a global maximum may not be unique. It might happen twice. So if we have sign sends reals to reals, then the maximum value of one occurs infinitely many times. Okay. Any questions about this one? Well, so you can move on. Okay, so uh, just a general idea is that if f is sending from some from some domain to some codomain, then uh, the value f of x naught on the domain at x naught is said to be a global maximum if for all the f of x, whatever, whatever x you take within the domain, for all the f of x, you always have that f of x naught is bigger than or equal to f of x. So basically, the largest number in the range of the function is called the global maximum, if there is a global maximum. Right. OK? And can you explain that again? Yeah, the largest number in the range of the function is called the global maximum, if in fact there is a largest number, right? We saw in some right, previous sir. examples that there is no largest number. Sir? Yeah. So by now we have been talking about global and this, this word local. Yeah. Uh, are we having any particular limit that we are applying for looking at the local uh, maximum or the minimums or like the global is like quite fair that we're looking at the graph at, as a whole. But yeah. for the local one, it's the limit that we have to look for like on an X axis uh, on the, in the third quadrant or in the first quadrant. Is there a limit like this? Or what's the rule? Yeah, yeah, we'll discuss that when we get to the local. When we get to that. Oh, okay, sir. We're coming oh. up. Okay, similarly, what do you think a global minimum would be? It would be the smallest number, if there is one, in the range of the function. Okay. All right, so let's look at a particular one. Okay, so I define a function like this. F is sending minus two to four to the reals, and it's defined by minus of x cubed minus eight for x between minus two and two. And then x cubed minus eight, if uh, x is bigger than two and less than or equal to four. Okay, so the function is defined in two parts and its behavior is changing at x is equal to two. Okay. So it's said so there would be a global extrema at x is equal to four. Yeah, so we look at the graph, right? And there's a global minimum at x of zero at x is equal to two. 
and there's a global max of uh, at x is equal to four. Four cubed minus eight at x is equal to four. Six. Okay. So these are the the smallest number in the range of the function and the biggest number in the range of the function. Okay. Uh, questions? Uh, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, sir. Uh, okay, you can go. Go on. Then you go on. Okay, I will take. It. Uh, sir, uh, if uh, can you please move to the previous slide? Yeah. This one. No, sir. If there, uh, yes, sir. If there is a round bracket here instead of uh, um, square bracket uh, minus two, then we should have a uh, minima global minima because it is on two. Let's see. At minus two. Yeah. No. There. There won't. I mean, you still have the same global minimum and the same global maximum. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. That's the point I want to ask. Thank okay. you. Another Can question. Answer? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I was going to ask that uh, if we don't want to draw the graph, then we'll have to put each and every value in the function and then we'll get to know the global maxima. Uh -huh. Well, okay. So if it's, if these are functions which are uh, differentiable or piecewise differentiable, uh, then we will, we'll have other ways of doing it. Yes, because sir, the graph of this function is very difficult. Seems very difficult. <laughs> yeah. No. Okay. We'll we'll, show, we'll discuss another way of doing how to find these things. Sir. So, yes. Uh, when, uh, okay. Please, you go ahead. Uh, someone asked that if there were a round bracket instead of a square bracket in this question, then in this case we won't have a global maximum, right? But we will have a global minimum at two. Yeah, if, if you had a round bracket next to the four, let's say, then there would be no global maximum, right? And there would still and be if there was, yeah. And if there was a round bracket with minus two? Well, at minus two, have at mi minus two is well away from the global maximum and the global minimum, so that won't be effective. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, any other questions? No, so you can go ahead. Okay. All right. So some of you will have heard this idea about uh, taking the derivative and setting it equal to zero. And that's where the extreme are. So I just like to point out to you that at this point where you have a global minimum, the derivative is not defined. Okay. So, uh, just having derivatives equal to zero does not necessarily mean that you have a, mac a global maximum or a global minimum, okay? So why is that so? Because we have learned in previous years. Yeah, years well, scale. someone was lying to you, yeah. Okay. It's not sufficient by itself to set derivatives equal to zero. You have to do a bit more thinking than that. Okay. All right, so local extrema. Um, we're going to use the local extrema also to help us find global extrema. Okay. So what do I mean by that? So you have a local maximum f of x naught at a point x equals x naught. If there is some open interval a, b. So what you do is you take the, uh, intersection of some open interval with your domain. And if within that small range, or sorry, within that small uh, subdomain, if, if you have a maximum, then it's said to be a local maximum. Okay, so let's go back here. Okay, so x equals two, we had a local, we had a global minimum. x equals four, we had a global maximum. Now over here, if you look at the minus two, at x equals minus two, that's the highest point in a small neighborhood around minus two, okay? So if, if, if uh, we would call this a local maximum. Okay. Can you repeat this? 
if you t if if you take so supposing you go from minus two instead of going from minus two to four, you just go from minus two to minus one, let's say. Then the highest point in the graph is at minus two. Okay. So, so what so, I'm saying so is, if if in the local neighborhood, you have a maximum point or a minimum point, then you then you can say that you have a local maximum or a local minimum at that point. Okay. So here's a uh, local maximum at x equals minus two. Because in a small sample. neighborhood, if you take numbers close to minus two, say from minus two to minus 1.5, the biggest number you have is f of minus two. So it's a local maximum. Sir, can I ask a yeah. question? Yeah. Uh, sir, we are talking about the neighborhood over here, the local neighborhood. Yeah. Let's assume the population or the community size of that neighborhood increases. And now yeah, we're considering no, no. if if in any neighborhood, no matter how big or how small, you have a, a biggest point at that point, you have a biggest value at that point, then you have a local maximum at that point. Okay. Okay. So will the so like, local range uh, be given to us or yes, will sir. No, no, no. Okay. So will the local neighborhood be specified to us? No, it won't. Sir, how do we decide the width just, of just, the local just, neighborhood? Just, just listen to my description first, and then you'll see. Oh, okay, sir. Okay. Look here at x equals minus two. If I at x equals plus two. If I take the numbers from here to here, you know, just on either side, we take a small interval, which includes mine, which includes x equals plus two then zero is the smallest, right? So if I, take a sm if I take a subdomain, so I have the domain of the function is from minus two to four, mm -hmm. but I take a subdomain, which is an intersection of an open interval with the domain. And in that subdomain, I have a small, uh, smallest value, the range has, has a smallest value or a largest value, then that's called a local min or a local max. So you have a, also a local min of zero at x is equal to two. Okay. So, so why is it an open interval? Uh, because weird things happen when you include boundary points. So sir, local extrema only exists when the interval is open? No, the, the local extrema exists if the if within the intersection of an open interval and your domain of the function, you have a biggest value or a smallest value, then you have a local. So, so will I be right in saying that there can be like three neighborhoods in the in the global this graph from negative two to zero and zero to two and two to four? Yeah. Okay. So really, we're thinking about very tiny neighborhoods. Okay. Okay. So, so, sir, in this graph, yeah. if we had a uh, interval uh, near the value two, two, how yeah. do we know our local extrema? Because the values are quite similar between that. No, no. It, it, if we we know we know that it touches down at zero at x is equal to two, right? So if you take an but that's going to be our minimum. Yeah. What about the maximum? Okay. So there there will be no on an open in, if you take an open interval about x is equal to two, a small open interval about x equals two, there will be no maximum. Right, that's so why we're not mean? taking closed intervals, because then if we included the boundary points, there would be maxima all, all over the place. So what do you mean when you say open interval? Are you referring that uh, it's th that, that sort of a... Both, both brackets are round. Round brackets, yeah. okay. So, sir, can we also call for a local extrema? Yeah, that, that's that's it. Our loc our global maxima are and minima are also local maxima and minima, right? So, if you find all the local maxima and minima, hopefully, you also find in those local maxima and minima, you also find the global maxima. And minima. 
And we can use the calculus to help us find those points, okay? Again, this local minimum, which is also a global minimum, is occurring when the derivative is not defined, okay? This global maximum is occurring exactly. where, well, it's just at the end point. So you have to treat endpoints specially. If you look, if you if you want to find uh, maxima and minima, you also have to look at the endpoints. So, so yeah. at x is equal to four, yeah. uh, the derivative of of that function of this function is not equal to zero, right? No. In fact, yeah, it's it's not. Sir, so then and, what was the purpose of taking a derivative to that first derivative in order to calculate the ma extreme uh, maximum and the minimum points? Okay. For, for certain types of functions, you can use the derivatives to give you candidates for where the local maximum and the local minimum might be. You still have to do more analysis than just setting the derivative equal to zero. Okay. Okay. So. All right. Supposing I have a function, f sends minus three to three to the reals, defined by f of x equals x minus two quantity squared. Okay. Uh, where do you think the local maxima and the global maxima are? So the x equals two. X equals two will give us a global minimum. Right, but I'm asking about maxima. Sir, it's going to be at x is equal to negative three because negative three, negative two, add of negative five, it's squared up to 25. Yeah, right. So you're going to have uh, a global maximum at x equals minus three, right? Yes, sir. And you're going to have a local maxima at what? Sir, when at x is equal to two, because two minus two is uh, zero and zero squared is zero again. That'll, that'll be a global minimum and a local minimum also. Where's yes, your sir. global maximum? There's x, x is equal to three. negative. At x there is no global maximum. Three. There is no global maximum. Yeah, at x equals three, there's a, no. There's a global maximum at x equals minus three. There's a local maximum at x equals three. Right. Sir, how? Sir, can you please explain the local yes, maximum, sir. local minimum, please? I still did not get how okay. we'll uh, get to know that. What is the local one? Okay. Uh, let me. See. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and get the graph drawn so I can show you more clearly. Okay. Squared. Uh, okay. Plot x minus two squared from x equals minus three to three. Okay. okay. And uh, I will share the plot with you. Okay. So hopefully everyone can see the plot, right? Okay, so this is a squaring function and the smallest value that a squaring function can produce is zero and it produces a value zero at x is equal to two. Okay, so that's the smallest value that a squaring function can produce. So that's a global minimum of, of zero at x equals two. Is that okay? Yes. Okay, now if I just take a small open interval about x equals two, then it's also the smallest value in that interval, right? Yes. yes. So it's also a local minimum? Yes. Okay. So we will take the interval, we'll take the local interval uh, near two, where, yeah. the, where we have the uh, global yeah. minimum, right? Containing two, and then take a small interval around it, and you will see that that's the smallest value possible there too also. So 
It's a local minimum. Okay, now let's go over here to all the way to the left, okay? So what happens? At x equals minus three, we have a value of 25, and that's the biggest value in the range. So it has a global maximum at x equals minus three of 25. So I, was saying, I was saying that it has to be at x is equal to negative three. Yeah, all right, so there's a global maximum of 25 at x equals minus three. Okay. So, but I couldn't understand what that bracket thing was. Which bracket? So there was someone who was referring to a bracket that due to that bracket, the maximum point well, okay. cannot so, be negative. So that's, that's just a question, square bracket, round bracket is a question about whether the end point is included or not. In this case, the end points are included, okay? Yes, sir. All right, so now imagine that I take around x is equal to minus three. I take an open interval from minus three minus delta to minus three plus delta. I make delta a very small number, right? And then within that, so from minus three, because it's on the endpoints, the, the points to the left don't, we don't have to worry about those. So from minus three to minus say 2.9, the biggest number that you, the biggest function value is still 25, right? So that global maximum of 25 is also a local maximum. Okay? Got it, sir. Just in that small neighborhood of points in the domain close to minus three, the biggest value of the range is 25 at x equals minus 3. So it is a... But can't local. you just determine that there is no local max or local min just by looking at the graph? No. Because clearly here the global max and the global min are the same. Are the same as the local max and the local min. Yeah, yeah okay. So now let's, and, look, let's look over here the on the other end, right? When we're looking for global maximum and minimum, we always have to consider the endpoints, okay? Now at x is equal to three, what's happening? I have a value of one. That's not a global max or a global min. There are numbers in the range which are bigger and there are numbers in the range which are smaller than one. But mm -hmm. if I just consider numbers that are just a little bit smaller than three, right? Going up to three, just in that small little neighborhood. Let's, let's do this. Uh, so now I just consider the small neighborhood 2.99 to 3. Okay. Then there's a local maximum of x equals 1. Uh, sorry, of f of x equals 1 when x is equal to 3. Okay. So that's a local maximum. Look on this graph. It's the, that's the highest value that you have, right? Uh, but sir, didn't you say that the local uh, maximum or minimum should have an open interval instead of a closed yeah, one? Yeah, if I take, right, if I take an open interval and I intersect it with the domain. <coughs> oh, oh, okay, right? okay, yeah. now I understand. Okay. So, uh, so three will be so included. The in example the... we just saw there, the global, uh, the local maximum was twenty-five two, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's. Okay. So there was a value. Of, we were going from minus three to three, right? So let's go from minus three to minus two point nine nine nine. Okay. That's going to be a very straight okay. line. All right. So this is the highest value of 25. I don't take numbers to the left of minus three because that takes me outside of the domain, okay? okay. Now at x equals two, Sir? yes? For the max, for the local maximum and global maximum, you taking the end point, but why not for the minimum? Okay, uh, sorry, can you, can you speak up a bit? Yeah, I said that for the global maximum and local maximum, we are taking the endpoints and 
yeah. finding our maximum minimum value from there. So why not for the minimum we do the same thing? Like take yeah, yeah, points. yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's what you need to do. You, you need to find. You need to find uh, local ma maxima, local minima, and you always need to test the endpoints. Right. We're going to find the local maximum and the local minimum with derivatives, but the endpoints have to be tested separately if there are endpoints. That is, if you have got, if you, where you have square brackets when you're defining your interval, then you have endpoints, right? Okay. So here, hmm? at two in a small neighborhood, about x equals two. Zero is the smallest value. So it's a local minimum. Okay. So what's going to be the global minimum for this graph? It's, it's also uh, a global minimum. Since this, okay. this, this function can't produce negative values, so it'll also be the global minimum. Okay. Right. Yes. All right. Yes, sir. I have a question. Yes. Will we call to the global minimum or zero the global minimum? Like, are we gonna uh, use the no. x term or the term to, y? No. <coughs> we would say that there's a global minimum of zero at, which occurs at x is equal to two. All right, thank you, sir. Okay. So, but uh, isn't like uh, the global minimum or the maximum has to be determined uh, in the range from negative three to three like this particular yes. graph, which was, yes. it wasn't yes. like, we did that. We looked at the graph. We found the global maximum. We found the global minimum. And then we also looked elsewhere to see where the local maximum or minimum might be. So, so we were working uh, with the local max and the minimums. Yeah. Right, sir? Yeah. And if we can okay. find all the local maxima and minima, then among those local maxima and minima, there might also be global maxima and minima. Okay. Uh, uh, so, sir, uh, while finding out the local maxima and minima, we have to first concentrate uh, at the endpoints. Like, we'll put minus three, well, and then we'll put three. We, 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 if we have endpoints in the definition of our domain, then we should also consider what's happening there. Okay. But, sir, for, the exa for this example, we first found the global maxima, and then we found the uh, local maxima from there. Yes, yes. Again. So, are we supposed to know the global maxima before for finding the local maxima? No, it, it would depend upon the function. I mean, for some functions, it'll be really obvious. For another one, you might have to look, do a bit more work. Yeah. Uh, sir, I have a question. Yeah. So, for example, we found the global maximum. Yeah. And then we have to take a small interval around it to find the local maximum. No, if you found a global maximum, then that global maximum is also a local maximum. And it holds for every uh, graph. Yeah. Every function. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So global maximum and minimum. Uh, yeah. Is there a possibility uh, that there are more than one uh, local maximums or the local minimums? Y yes. There could be infinitely many. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, Let's take a look at another function. <laughs> f of x equals one quarter x to the fourth minus one half x squared. Okay. Um, and so, and the domain are the real and the codomains are the reals. Okay. Now, uh, take a look at the graph of the function. Okay. So, do you think that there are any global maxima here? No. no, no, sir. No, right? Because as x gets very, very big, the term that counts is one quarter x to the fourth. So it's just it, this just gets arbitrarily large as you go to minus infinity or plus infinity. So there's no global maximum. Okay. Uh, from the graph, does it look like there's a global minimum? Yes, sir. Yes. yes sir. Yes, so there it, is. Looks, it looks like there's there's two. It looks like there there's two. a global it's, minimum. It's, 
and it occurs at negative twice, one and one. At minus one and at plus one. Okay. So yes, sir. can can uh, zero at x is equal to zero be considered as a local maximum? Right. Now now let's think it about local maximum. Let's think about local maxima. At zero, if you take a small interval containing zero, right? It looks like there's a global maximum at zero, okay? A local maximum. Yeah. What about the local min? Where, where do the local mins happen? So at at equal to negative one and one? At minus one and at plus one, okay? So, so there could there could have been a local maximum at x is equal to zero. So if like we would have been considering uh, a okay. range from negative one. To uh, all right, all right, at zero. Okay, so let's let's take a look. I'm going to uh, let's take a look. Let's do a close up plot. Okay, so plot uh, x to the four over four minus x squared over two from, and we were, you were saying at x equals, okay, so minus Next. 0 0.1 to plus 0 0.1. Let's see what that looks like. Yeah, so there's, there's a local maximum at x is equal to zero. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Let, let's see what happens around minus one. So minus 1.1 1 .1 to minus uh, 0 0.9. Yep. Okay. So this seems to be a local minimum at uh, at minus one, okay. And let's see what happens at plus one. So at from 0 0.9 to 1.1, what's happening? Again, there seems to be a local minimum at x equals one, okay? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. All right, so let's go back to the Okay, and remember that there are no endpoints in this graph. I was mapping from reels to reels. Okay, okay. <clears throat> so that's a discussion, and we've been looking at the graphs and the values. We haven't actually been doing any calculus at this point. Okay, so now we're, we're going to see how the calculus can help us. We're going to define increasing and decreasing functions. Okay. Uh, so for linear functions, the rate of increase or decrease is basically uh, by the slope or the gradient when you have y equals mx plus b. Uh, the sine of m tells you whether positive means that the function is increasing to the right. Negative m means the function would be decreasing to the right. And m is the rate of increase or decrease, right? The change in y with respect to x, that's what this m is. Okay, so now if we want to do this for general functions, what we do is we say that the slope of the tangent, we're, we're going to be, we're not looking at uh, a line anymore, but we can consider its tangent line at a point. So if the derivative of f exists at x naught and that's positive, we say that the function is increasing at x naught. And if the derivative of f exists at x equals x naught, and that derivative is negative, then we say that the function is decreasing at x naught. Okay. Sir, I have one question. Yes. Sir, so just like we were discussing that uh, in a particular example on page number six, that uh, when we take the derivative dy by dx, it doesn't work. 
at x is equal to if the derivative is equal to zero, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So if the function is increasing or decreasing, which we are doing right now, and if we take a second derivative of the very statement, will it be like legitimate? Because we have denied that the first derivative is wrong. How can the second uh, one be okay. right? Yeah. So if the, if the first derivative ex doesn't exist, then you can't take the second derivative, right? Okay, sir. Sir, if the derivative is zero, is it going to be an increasing or decreasing function? Yeah, uh, neither. Neither. It isn't increasing or decreasing. That's going to be a constant one. Yeah. Okay, so at 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 it, for example, on this graph. So the 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 red line is the actual curve, the actual graph of the function we're interested in. And then we have a tangent line, right, at some point. And then uh, this tangent line is, has, has a positive slope or gradient. So the function at x naught was increasing. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, so we discussed whether a function is increasing or decreasing at a point, let's say that you have an interval. So you have a set of points. And at every point on the interval, the derivative is positive. Then we would say that f is increasing on that interval. Right? Right. If on some interval, we had that the, uh, the derivative at every point or the slope of the tangent line at every point is negative, then we will say that the function is decreasing, right? So as you go to the right, the values of the function are decreasing. Okay. Okay, so let me ask you, you have f of x equals x to the four over four minus x squared over two can you tell me if f is, when is f increasing and decreasing and on what intervals? Uh, sir, first of all, we need to take the first derivative yeah. of this. You're, you're right. Uh, so we, we, we have to take the derivatives. So here, let's take to the derivative. The derivative when we take it is x cubed minus x. And yes, I, fact, I, I factor it as x times x minus one times x plus one. Okay? Yes, sir. So now we see that, now what are the roots of that derivative? When does the derivative become zero? So add x is equal to one and the second one is going to be x is equal to negative one. And when x is equal to zero? Yeah. Okay. So that's when x is equal to zero, that will be when the function perhaps is changing from being increasing to decreasing or from decreasing to increasing, right? So those are the interesting, the points where uh, f, of, f prime of x is equal to zero or where f prime of x is not defined are the interesting points to consider, mm -hmm. okay? So yes, um, now we look at the intervals between those points. Such points are called critical points. When the derivative is zero or the derivative does not exist, we call those the critical points of the function. And we're interested in what happens in the, inter in the intervals between the critical points, okay? So if we're coming from minus infinity, then we go all the way up to minus one and at minus one, we have a critical point. Yes, there's a question. Yes, sir. I wanted to ask, how did we get these intervals? Did, like it's decreasing on this and increasing on these. Yeah, yes, right, right. So uh, let, let's consider that, that's an important point. So look over here, there's a critical point at X is equal to minus one, right? Okay. So if I, and, and that's, so the critical points are minus one, one and zero. So the point to the left, it, 
the, the critical point, which is the leftmost, is minus one. And then there's no critical point all the way out to minus infinity. Okay? So that's the interval that we're going to consider. We're going to consider the interval from minus infinity to minus one. Now, put in a number which is less than minus one and tell me what you get. If I put in a number which is less than minus one into x plus one, do I get something that's positive or negative? You're going to get a, a negative number. And when a I put number. it into x minus one, I put a minus one in here or something less than minus one in here, I'll get another negative number, right? Okay. So it's going to be a zero. Yes. And if I put in a negative number less than minus one into x, I'll get another negative number. So these three factors at any so, point on this interval from minus infinity to minus one, I pick a number, I stick it into here, then I will get a number which is negative. That number is the so, derivative. The derivative is negative on this interval. So it's so, decreasing on that interval, yes? So you said that at a uh, will you take a negative number which is like negative one, the function is going to give out a negative number. No, yeah, that no so I'll, I'll take a number like minus 1.1. 1. 1. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. Okay. Is there another question? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, how did you come up with this interval of minus 1? Can you explain the critical point thing again? Yeah. So I take my derivative and I say, where are the critical points? The critical points of the derivative, well, the critical points of the function are where the derivative is not defined or where the derivative is equal to zero. Okay, here the derivative is defined everywhere, but I can work out where the derivative is equal to zero. The derivative will be zero when x equals zero, when x equals one, or when x equals minus one. Okay, now that yes, means that in between those points, the derivative is either positive or negative. Okay, because this derivative is a continuous function. So there are points where it's zero, and then there are points where it's in between those points where it's zero, it's either positive or negative. Okay, so okay, the leftmost critical point that we found was minus one. Okay, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right, so from minus one to minus infinity, there are no critical points. Uh, okay, sir. Right? So uh, there's my first interval that I want to think about. Now, uh, sir, sir. Yes. So the, 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 this, this particular thing which I've written, like decreasing on from negative infinity yeah. and comma negative one, shouldn't it be like zero comma negative one? Because when we move from on x axis from zero to negative one, it's decreasing at that point. Okay. Right. So I, work, I worked out my first interval, that is, Work out where your leftmost point is, and okay. then all the way out to minus infinity, there are no other points. Okay? There's no so other there are point. no other there are no other critical points. There's no point at which where the derivative goes to zero again. So that okay, means so. on the interval from the leftmost critical point, which is minus one, all the way out to minus infinity, there is no point where the derivative goes to zero again. I, right? I'm totally I saying that's correct, but I'm saying the second bracket uh, written next to the decreasing on thing, it I'm, should I'm, have been zero. I'm, 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 right now, I'm just trying to find the intervals. We'll discuss decreasing or increasing again later, right? First, there was a question about the intervals, right? So then there's a critical point at minus one, we agreed, and there's another critical point at zero. Right? And yes, so sir. that's an interval that we need to consider. So there's an interval 0, 1. Then when we've got to 1, then to the right of 1, there's no more critical points. OK? Right? OK, so the critical points were minus 1, zero and one, okay? So from minus infinity to minus one is one interval. 
From minus one to zero is another interval. From zero to one is another interval. And then from one to infinity is another interval. Okay, so is it, is it clear where the, where the intervals come from? Yes, sir, this part is clear. Sir. Okay, now on the intervals, that derivative is either positive or negative. Yes, sir. Okay, so you can take just any point in the interval and you can throw it into the, the, this derivative formula and you just have to work out whether it's positive or negative. Oh, okay, sir. Okay? Okay, sir. So yeah, sir. if we agree on the interval from minus infinity to minus one, okay, take a point from it, say minus 1.1, and stick it into this formula for the derivative, and you will get a negative number. Okay? Yes, sir. And because you get a negative number for every point on that interval, the function is a, the, 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 the function is decreasing on the interval. Yes. Okay. Now we go from okay. minus one to zero. Sir, sir, can you please explain again this concept of zero comma one for decreasing function? Okay. All right. So uh, on the interval from zero to one, let's say, uh, Right, so there was a critical point at zero and then the next critical point to the right is one. If you take a number like one half, if you let x equal one half and you stick it into this formula for the derivative, you will get a negative number. And that means that the function is decreasing on that interval. So, but if we like put x is equal to zero in, in the derivative of the function, it comes out to be zero and yeah, if that, you put like one. Right. So, so that's why we're not considering zero. Okay. Okay. It's sir. round bracket. So 0 0.1 will be considered, sir, if you're considering anything lower. Okay. okay. So now if we look at the interval from minus one to zero, let's say we take minus one half and we stick it into this formula, we would get a mm -hmm. positive number. So the function is increasing on that interval. And then is one is a critical point and there's no critical points to the right. So we consider the interval from one to infinity. The function will either be increasing there or decreasing there. All right. It's a continuous function, so it has to vary smoothly, right? And you would get a positive, if you, if you take any number, like take the x equals two, stick it into the formula for the derivative, you're going to get a positive number. So the function is increasing on that interval. Okay. All right, so these are the intervals that we found, all right? And you can see on the leftmost interval, from minus infinity to minus one, the function was decreasing. Then it starts to increase again, from minus one to zero, it's increasing. Then the next interval was from zero to one and the function was decreasing. And then from uh, one to positive infinity, the function values are increasing again. Uh, sir, uh, what about the first interval, which was minus one to minus infinity? Okay, from minus one to minus infinity, the function, all right, the, the function is decreasing, right? As you go towards minus one, if you go from minus two to minus one, you can see that the function values are decreasing. Yes, sir. And from minus one to zero, it's increasing? Yeah. So what was the equation of this graph? X to the four over four minus X squared over two. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. So now let's look at what's happening at the critical points. There's a critical point of minus one. The function went from being decreasing to the left of minus one, to being increasing to the right of minus one. And here we seem to have a local minimum. At zero, to the left of zero, the function was increasing. To the right of zero, the function was decreasing. And we seem to have a maximum, a local maximum, okay? 
And if you look at one, to the left of one, the function is increasing. And to the right of one, sorry, to the left of one, the function is decreasing. To the right of one, the function is increasing. And we seem to have a local minimum. Uh, Fatima had a question. Uh, yes, sir. I just wanted to say that without the graph, it's pretty uh, difficult to figure out the increasing and decreasing functions. I mean, it's easy to find out the intervals, but you know, in which direction they go, it's kind of hard to figure out. So, in like, will we be given a graph with it with every question? Uh, well, the, the I uh, okay. So we're developing something that's called the first derivative test. And just knowing the derivatives and the signs of the derivatives will give you what you want. Okay, you won't have to draw the graph. So the it was an increasing function from the interval uh, which goes from minus one to zero, right? Yeah, it's increasing from minus one to zero. Yeah. Okay. Sir. Okay. So, what happens at a local maximum? The function is increasing. The derivative goes to zero. Right, the ten, and then the function is decreasing, if, if the derivative exists, right? So that's the behavior at a local maximum. At a local minimum, the function is decreasing, the derivative goes to zero, and then the function is increasing, right? So that's the behavior at a local minimum. Okay, in all of this, we're assuming the derivatives exi actually exist. Okay, uh, what else could happen? Well, there's a global minimum and there's a global maximum, uh, sorry, there's a global minimum and there's a local minimum at x is equal to two. And here, the derivative doesn't exist, okay? So you have also have to be, if, if you have a function like this where the derivative doesn't exist, you also have to be interested in what's happening there. Okay. So Sir, how yeah. do we know that the derivative doesn't exist uh, at x is equal to two? Uh, well, if you, tr if you tried calculating the, if you tried calculating the derivative, um, you'd see that it didn't exist. You'd have to go back to the, the the definition of the function, okay? Okay, so I've used this terminology, critical points, okay? These are the points where the derivative does not exist or where the derivative is equal to zero. Those are the points which are of interest to us, at least for many applications, okay? So, here's the theorem. If local extrema occur at a point x naught in an open interval, where, f and, where the function and its derivative are defined, then the derivative at x naught will be equal to zero. Okay? This doesn't say that when the derivative at x naught equals zero, you have a local extrema. If the function is nice and differentiable and there are local extrema at some point, right? On an, in an open interval where f of x and f prime of x are defined, then f prime of x naught is equal to zero, okay? So we want to look for the points where the derivative is equal to zero or where the derivative does not exist. Uh, if there's a well-behaved function where the function exists and the derivative exists, and those are the points where um, we should look for, it's a candidate, that point is a candidate for being, for giving us a local maximum, local minimum. It might not, but it's possible that that's where, at such a point. Okay. Okay, so for example, the example that we were doing, x to the four over four minus x squared over two, there were critical points at minus one, zero, and one. And these are the points where the local extrema were occurring. 
Okay. Once again, derivative equals zero at a point does not mean that there's a local max or a local min at that point. For example, if f of x equals x cubed, then the derivative at zero is equal to zero, but there is no max and there is no min at that point, right? If you think about the graph of that function, no max and no min is, is occurring there. Okay. If you are looking for global extrema, then you should check the endpoints as well as the critical points. Okay. So this, this function we were doing, if we restrict its values from minus three to three, if we restrict the, the, the domain from the closed interval to the closed interval minus three to three, and it's being mapped to the reals, f of x equals x to the four over four minus x squared over two, then there's a global maximum at x equal of two at x equals minus two. There's a global maximum of two at x equals plus two. This is also, we could also call this a local max, right? Okay, and At minus one, you have a global as well as a local min. At plus one, you have a global as well as a local min. And at x equals zero, you have a local maximum. It's not a global maximum because there are larger values in the domain of this function. But in a small neighborhood, about x equals zero, uh, the value zero is the biggest value. But earlier you said in a graph similar to this that there was no global maxima. Was that because the interval was not closed? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Okay. Is there another question? Sir, yes, sir. in this there are two global maxima and two. Oh, no. Global there, 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 there's a global maximum value which occurs twice. There's a global minimum value, which occurs twice on the domain of this function. Yeah. Okay, sir. Are there any other questions? Yes, sir. Okay. Sir, so, I have a question. Yeah. Sir, I wanted to ask that from this graph, can we say that at critical points, the graph would be the graph would have a turning point. Is it necessary for all the graphs or for this particular graph that the critical points are the ones that are having the turning point? Uh, what do you mean by a turning point? So, where the gradient becomes zero. Uh, well, yeah. Or I we think, could say that. I think what you would mean is where the gradient becomes zero and where the on a the um, the sign of the derivative changes, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So that's basically the first derivative test. So what does these, uh, so can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. So what does these color changes represent? Oh, those are the intervals. Those are showing okay, us sir. the intervals. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. So the first derivative test. Supposing f is continuous at a critical point C, all right? If the derivative is greater than zero on the open interval, extending from the left of C, and the derivative is negative on an open interval extending from the right of the critical point, then f has a relative maximum at C. So if you go from positive derivative to zero at C, and then negative derivative, then you have a local maximum. Okay, local or relative, we also say relative maximum. Okay. Uh, sir? Yeah. So we can't have a global maximum or global minima in an op uh, open interval, right? Yeah, you want to check your local, you want to check your local, when you find your local extrema, 
you want to check if maybe there are global extrema in there, and then you also have to check the endpoints. So you said that for an open interval, you can't have a global maximum, global minimum. Well, if it, if an, if you have an open interval, then you don't have endpoints. Okay. Okay. All right. So this is what's happening at zero. You're going from positive derivative to negative derivative and zero derivative at x equals zero. Sir, okay. can I just um, can I just reiterate what you're yeah. trying to explain so I can understand it better? What you're saying is that if you want to find the local the local max or the local min or the global max or the global min, all we do is take the first order derivative and restrict it to an interval and see if within that interval uh, the derivative is either greater than zero or less than zero. If it is greater than zero, then that probably means that it's a it's a local or a global max, and if it's less than zero, then it's probably some form of a minimum. Uh, Is that what you're at, at, at at the critical point? Your derivative is zero, or your derivative is undefined. Okay, yeah. that's my C here, the critical point. Yeah, and yeah. then if Basically the, the stationary point. if the derivative is positive before C and negative after C, then you have a relative maximum or a local maximum. Okay, again, at but C- How does the first derivative test test for a global maximum though? It doesn't, it gives, you, it gives you candidates for a global maximum or a global minimum. Ah, ah it's fair enough, fair enough. Find, find the local so maximum and minimum, and then maybe uh -huh. one of those is a global maximum or minimum. Is there another test which we can use to figure out which one of those is actually the global max, global extrema? Uh, yes, but it only works if the function is twice differentiable, which isn't always the case. Okay. Uh, okay, now we continue the test. So at C, your derivative is either zero or it doesn't exist. And then if to the left of C, your uh, derivative is negative, and then to the right of C, your derivative is positive, then F has a relative minimum at C. Okay. So that's the first derivative test. Ah, now, if you have a critical point. So the derivative does not exist or the, the derivative is zero at x equals c. So that's your critical point. And then to the left of c, the derivative is the same sign as it is to the right of c, then f does not have a relative maximum or a relative minimum there. So f of x equals x cubed, right? The derivative is always positive except at x equals zero. So when you have x is equal to zero, to the left, the derivative is positive, and to the right, the derivative is positive. And so there is no, uh, there is no max or min at x equals zero for the function f of x equals x cubed. Okay. Um, so, okay, so we're, at, we're out of time. Let me just, let me just go through this and then you check the details yourself. Okay. And then we'll continue with this discussion, uh, in the next class. So next week. So the same function minus three to three map to R X to the four over four minus X squared over two. Uh, you take the, you take the derivatives you find out where the derivative is equal to zero, right? And then you say, to the left of this critical point, what's the sign? And to the right of this critical, what's the sign? So if it goes from being derivative positive to derivative zero, to derivative negative, I guess, right? That would be a local max. If it goes from being derivative positive, sorry, derivative negative, then derivative zero at the critical point, 
then derivative positive, then that's the local min, okay? Right, and if it goes from, there's a critical point, but to the left and to the right, the derivative has the same sign, then you have no maximum or minimum, okay? And then when you found your possibilities for local max and local min, and you're looking for global max and min, then you also have to test the endpoints. What are the values of f of minus three and f of positive three? Okay. Then from all those values, you check whether this is the biggest one or a smallest one. Okay. Is that all right? Okay. And I'd, I'd also like you to try and do this for f of x equals absolute value of x. Okay, so that there uh, uh, you have a global minimum and a local minimum of zero at x equals zero, and the critical point is where the is where the derivative is undefined. All right. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, should we expect an assignment regarding this topic and the topic that we did last time? Before yeah, uh, I'll 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 make sure that there's a there's an assignment uh, on this. Okay, uh, I'll take care of that right uh, after. So another question, sir. Yeah. Uh, has the syllabus for the midterm been decided? Uh, it'll be announced a week next, away. It'll be announced in the next day or two. Okay, but probably up to here will be on it. At, at least up till here would be on it. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. So that's, that's it for this lesson. Uh, I will see you on Tuesday. Uh, sir, one last yeah. question. Sure. We haven't done the main value theorem, have we? Yeah, no. I, yeah, we have. Thank you. Okay. Uh, sir? Oh, yeah. Uh, somebody said that we can't have tests on weekends now. So will the mid be? The oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, the, the dean asked us not to have things on the weekends, except uh, the point is that if we, we uh, when we have multi-section classes, right, it's, it's uh, very awkward to try and find uh, free time on. Oh, all right, all right. All right, any other questions? Okay. So uh, in, the, in the next class, I will quickly go over this and then we'll also do the, uh, the second derivative test. So if you're fortunate, the second derivative exists and you can do this even, it's a little bit easier, okay? So I will see you on Tuesday.